Hi, I'm Dave Dinkel. I'm here with your next two-minute series tip. And the question that comes up very often times is, what if the buyer doesn't come to closing? Okay, remember you have a signed contract that you can enforce. It's an enforceable contract. It's probably been put together, I hope, by the Board of Realtors or the Bar Association. Some of those contracts are online. Some of them are not online. Some states you can lease the contract. You don't have to be an attorney or a realtor to use it. But nonetheless, I hope you didn't use a guru contract that very specifically stipulates onerous things on your side. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. What matters is the guy's not coming to closing. And somewhere in your material, your contract, it should say if you don't come to closing, your limit of liability is, in fact, the earnest money deposit. That's what's the same contract as when you're the buyer. So you have that same protection, I'm going to say. So, can you sue the buyer for a specific performance not coming to closing? Yes. But, what are you going to get? His earnest money deposit, if you have to go through the gyrations of suing him, and then he has to pay for your attorney, uh, well, no. You'll get a judgment against him. If you can enforce it, he may have to pay for your attorney. I was in my attorney's office the other day, talking about a foreclosure I'm doing, because transactional funding didn't work out, so I had to foreclose. And the student bounced in and he said, you know, I'm, I'm doing a foreclosure on my contract. Not a mortgage and a note. Foreclosure on an equitable contract. A lien on the property. And I just talked to a judge in Florida who said to me, uh, you can't do that. He's a retired judge. He said, you can't do a foreclosure without having a note and a mortgage. I said, well, I hate to say this to you because you're an attorney and I'm just a guy that does foreclosures on ones where I don't have a note and a mortgage and we do it on a regular basis. All we have is a contract on the property. And in fact, the reason I was calling him was to tell him you know, I was doing a foreclosure without a note and a mortgage and without a contract on the property. And he said, you can't do it. My wife was on the bench for 30 some years. She was a judge and I know law. And I said, okay, well, what do you want to do? Call you when the judge approves it? He said, yeah. Uh, so call him back and I said, judge approved it. Overrode the motion for the defense that says, show us the note. I can't show you the note, don't have a note. So look, I'm, I don't want to get into these details, but whatever your traditional thinking is, you may be wrong, and you may be wrong by a lot. So here's what your remedies are, they're called, if the buyer doesn't come to closing. Your contract most likely is going to stipulate that his limit of liability is in fact his earnest money deposit. So in most cases, the best you can do is get his earnest money deposit. Now, I did an REO one time, and I read the contract, and deep in the contract it said, not only was the earnest money deposit forfeited, but because of some stupid reason, the buyer would have to forfeit another $5,000 if he didn't close timely. That's the only bank that I've ever seen do it. If you said to me, what's the name of the bank? I don't remember. It probably was a state bank. It doesn't matter. The contract was valid and I signed it. So is there an additional limit of liability? Uh, no. That's what the contract says. If you think there is, read the contract and you'll see what it is. So now the buyer doesn't come to closing. What do you do? Well, if you're past your inspection period, which it has to be, because your closing is going to be another two or three weeks or 30 days, you're faced with the fact that you have to resell the property. If he's not coming to closing just before the closing, you can't resell it fast enough in most cases. Well, you're going to forfeit your earnest money deposit. How much is it? The minimum you could put up. How much is his? Two to five times whatever you put up for sure. Make sure he doesn't have a small earnest money deposit. I just did one of my two-minute HUD reviews. The student was, I'm going to say forced, put up $2,700 as a deposit. The end buyer put up $500. That's backwards. Don't do that or you're not going to walk away with money in your pocket if the buyer doesn't come to closing. So how often does it happen? Well, again, uh, you can see this over my shoulder here. Those are, I only close about one-tenth of the properties that we, that we see go through our system from both joint venture people, students, partners, so on and so forth. There's 80 through, I'm not at the end of March yet. So we close, are, are involved in closings, as many as two to 400 a month. How do we do that? It's automated. We don't do the closings. We don't go to closings. Everything is done for us by the closing agent. So when you t hear guys talk about, oh, I did 100 contracts, I did 100 properties this year. Great. That's a good level. 
that's a good level where you should be making a million dollars net uh, as a wholesaler. As a rehabber, I don't have any idea what you're going to make. But I have students that do 100 properties a year, 85 to 115, and they're, they net. You will see them if you watch my videos, 1.8 million, 1.9 million. Do they have giant crews running around out there? Both of those two guys, and you can see them on my videos, um, do not do rehabs. Well, one of them does rehabs, and he loses money on his rehab. So every year he says to me, I'm only going to wholesale again, and what does he do? He rehabs a couple, a few, and loses money on them. I'm not saying don't rehab. You, you're going to get this idea that I said don't rehab. If you're wholesaling and you can cherry pick the best deals, take it and try it. But don't stop wholesaling because you need a cash flow. One of the worst things that can happen to you in rehabbing is you run out of money. And those are great deals for us. I mean, they really are. As investors, wholesalers, we come in, you've done all the work, except finishing it up. So now the demo and drywall and electrical and boom, you're out of money. So what does it cost us? Very little. And what's it worth? The same retail value that you, you could have gotten before had you not lost the deal. So what I'm telling you is it's very simple to buy a course on rehabbing. And it makes it look very, very simple. The problem with rehabbing are the things that come out of the wood that you would have never expected and weren't in your list of priorities. Uh, sometimes where you have um, a basement. Hey, it was a pretty good basement, but the first time it rained, it flooded. Uh, what does that take? Ah, that takes a lot of work. Foundation issues. Uh, sinkholes. I got a call from a, uh, an investor on the west coast of Florida, and he said to me, I got this deal, it's 165000 it's an office condo. So I look it up, I do an appraisal on it. It's got to be worth $400,000. i am saying to myself, good deal. I love to see students and investors get those deals. So I said to him, okay, um, I'll do transactional funding for you. And he said, will you do extended? I said, not really. I, I really don't want to get into extended transactional funding. But it's what I do as part of my due diligence. I called the closing agent and I said to her, tell me about the closing. And she said, well, first, right off the bat, this is a closing agent for the lender because it's an REO. And she said, I have to give you full disclosure. You understand that this property is on the edge of an active sinkhole. Uh, no, I can't see that in the pictures. I couldn't see that from the aerial photography satellites. So what happened here? Well, if he did have a buyer for it, what's the likelihood of the buyer buying it when he finds out it's on an active sinkhole? You know, you walk out the back of your store and you look over the sidewalk and there's an active sinkhole. Please. I'm going to talk about liens and code violations. There's a lot of money to be made there, but you need to fully disclose them. I'll, I'll get into that in the next, uh, the upcoming two-minute tips. So what if the buyer doesn't close? It's an opportunity. Is it an opportunity to make as much money you would have had he closed? It depends. Just because he doesn't close doesn't mean you can't extend the closing date. If you extend the closing date, you'll have time to find another buyer. Now, if you're going to say to me, well, why would they extend the closing date? Because they sold it to you to solve a problem, and if you don't solve the problem, they may not be able to get out of it, get out of the problem. They want to get closed. You have the option to do that for them, so you need to come up with a reason why you need an extension. If you say to them, my buyer didn't close, you better have disclosed when you first saw them what you were doing. And here's a giant tip. You go into the seller, and the seller says, you know, what are you going to do with the house? There's only three things you can do with the house. And normally, you're going to say to them, we do one of three things. We're rehabbers. We're going to take it and turn it into a shining spot in the neighborhood and resell it. Uh, we're going to hold it for rental income. We have to rehab it. That's why you're getting a discount. You're solving a problem for them. And hold it as a rental. And sometimes we buy properties for other people. Boom. That's all you need to say. What does that mean, buy properties for other people? That's wholesaling it for somebody else that's going to do one of those two things that you just told them you would do. So don't worry if the buyer doesn't come. It's going to happen. I did two short courses. One's 16 ways, one's 18 ways to make sure a buyer comes to closing, and what if the buyer doesn't come to closing, and a few things like that. There's only a set number of things that can do, but they're very powerful. It's not a problem, and it will happen to you, so get over it. Go on to the next one. I'll see you in the next two-minute tip.